Hi, this is Sue Jackson of the Book by Book blog, and I am here with my Big Book Summer Challenge wrap-up. So you've been listening to me all summer long talk about Big Book Summer. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed it, as always. Um, as you might have seen in the, the opening photo on this video, I read a big stack of big books and also listened to big books on audio. So I have a lot to cover today. I am going to try my hardest not to talk too much about each book. I have a tendency to get long-winded when I'm talking about books that I love because I just want to convey to you how amazing they are. But I'm gonna try my hardest to just give a quick overview of my big book summer. I have my uh, reading journal here keep me on track. So the first book that I read for Big Book Summer was Dark Sacred Night by Michael Connelly. This is book two in his Renee Ballard series. She's an LAPD detective. And it is also a crossover book with the Harry Bosch series. My husband and I are longtime fans of Michael Connelly's writing and particularly his Harry Bosch series. Um, this is, I don't know, maybe 20 something for Harry. Um, but I loved that he brought his new character, Renee Ballard, together in this novel with the old beloved character, Harry Bosch. Excellent, excellent detective novel, mystery, thriller, suspense. Just really enjoyed it. My first audiobook for the Big Book Summer Challenge was A Light Too Bright by Samuel Miller. So this was a really unique, twisting story of a young man who um, is following in his grandfather's footsteps. So he's at a really low point in his life. He was named after his grandfather, who was a famous writer. Um, his grandfather died of dementia five years ago. And now when the grandson is at this real low point in his life, he finds one of, an old journal of his grandfather's written while he had dementia. So it's kind of sort of stream of consciousness type stuff, but he gets enough out of it that he heads off on a journey to figure out where his grandfather went in the last week of his life, which has been a big mystery in his family. So this is mystery, suspense, family drama. Um, it's coming of age because this young man is really trying to figure out what comes next in his life after all these horrible things have happened. Um, after I finished it, I saw that it was listed as YA um, on some book sites. I, I don't know, I, I guess, I mean, the main character is a young adult. I think he's 18 or 19 when the novel begins. So that makes sense. But I also think there is so much depth to this. There's absolutely no reason why any adult who enjoys immersive, um, in-depth fiction wouldn't enjoy this as well. So I'm not going to talk too much. <laughs> That's A Light Too Bright by Samuel Miller. My next big book in print was my big book classic for the summer, um, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. I had been hearing for years that this was a really great book, that I would enjoy it. My husband had read it. I didn't realize this when I started it, but basically it is the ultimate revenge tale. And when I figured that out, I wasn't too thrilled because I was like, I'm not really big into revenge. This isn't, this isn't going to be for me but it's it's very well written. There's a lot of suspense. There are a lot of twists and turns to this story um, and even a little humor woven in. So I did, like everyone said I would, I enjoyed The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, my big book summer classic. Next up on audio, I listened to Gone by Michael Grant. Now, I didn't realize when I started it, but this was book one of like a nine book series, I think. Um, it is YA, it's science fiction for the most part, um, but there's a lot to it. 
So at the beginning of the novel, there's a group of kids in this town in California. And one day, out of the blue, in the middle of the school day, all the adults in town disappear. In fact, anyone over the age of 14 disappears. So there's a lot going on in this novel and it was very good on audio. There are the, ki it's the kids trying to figure out what to do, the kids trying to figure out what on earth happened and all the adults disappearing is not the strangest thing that happens in this book by far. Other things begin to happen. It's like their little town has just gone nuts. So there's a lot to it. Um, it's science fiction. There's a little Lord of the Flies flavor to it because there are, of course, some bullies who take advantage of the situation and make a power grab. So there's a lot going on there. I really enjoyed Gone by Michael Grant. Next up was my favorite book of Big Book Summer. And now I think my favorite book of the year so far. And, and I don't see anything else surpassing it at this point. Um, Project Hail Mar Mary by Andy Weir. I can't tell you what this book is about. That is what it, what's so amazing about it. Past the first few pages, it's all spoilers. Because it begins with this man, who we soon find out is named Ryland Grace, um, waking up alone in some kind of medical facility, he thinks. He can tell he's been in a coma. There's all kinds of medical equipment and some sort of robot taking care of him. And he comes out of the coma. There are two other people in the room with him that both clearly died a long time ago. Their remains are basically mummified. And Ryland can't remember anything not even his own name. So he has retained math and science skills, those kinds of, of things. He was very good in math and science apparently, but he knows nothing about who he is, why he is where he is, what this place is, or what's going on. And so right from the beginning pages, every page is a discovery. Every page is something new and fresh. It's very twisty. Um, it's suspenseful. It is also, if you read The Martian by Andy Weir, this won't come as a surprise. It is also very, very funny. It's got that same kind of sense of humor, but Project Hail Mary is also very heartwarming. And that's what I loved about it. Um, my husband read it before I did, and as I was reading it, I would like just ex exclaim out loud, you know, laugh out loud or say, oh my gosh, or I don't believe it. <laughs> and my husband, he usually hates being interrupted in his reading, but he would put his book down and say, which part are you at? What's happening? Because it is just so amazing. This book is a delight to read from the first pages to the last. I was smiling almost the whole time I was reading it. It is just, you just have to take my word for it. It's great. Next up on audio, my husband and I were in the car together for two weeks. Um, we drove out to Oklahoma for his dad's funeral and then back. Um, so we had been caring for his dad who was 96 and had severe dementia, uh, sorry, 97. And um, so we haven't been able to travel in years. So although this wasn't a vacation, it was kind of nice, the two of us back on the road again, um, which we haven't done in a very long time. So one of our favorite things to do on road trips is listen to an audio book. And for this one, we picked a big book and also a thriller, which my husband loves, um, Since We Fell by Dennis Lehane. So like many of Dennis Lehane's novels, this is a psychological thriller. It's about a woman who goes through some trauma. Um, she becomes very anxious, but then she meets this wonderful man who she marries, who cares for her and helps her 
come back from some of this trauma and then something happens. <laughs> and, you know, it's the kind of book where, and I think this is sort of common with Lahaine, the beginning is kind of a slow build, getting to know the characters, um, seeing the, the setting and the details and what's happening with each of the characters. And then like the last third is very fast paced, action packed, a lot of surprise twists and turns in the plot. So that's Since We Fell by Dennis Lehane, which we listened to on audio. My next big book was Lucky Turtle by Bill Rohrbach. Now Bill is an author that I met at Booktopia this, this May. It's a book event that I go to um, every May in Vermont where authors and readers are brought together for the weekend. Um, so I, I got to talk to Bill at the, um, at the event. His book was just being released that week, so I didn't have a chance to read it ahead of time, um, but I did buy a copy there and saved it for Big Book Summer. This was a really, really great book. I loved every minute of it. If I hadn't gone so crazy over Project Hail Mary, this might have been, this would have been my best of the summer. It's that good. Um, Lucky Turtle is about a young woman who's only 16 years old. Her name's Syndra. When she gets in trouble and is sent to a, an, a wilderness, um, a wilderness reform camp. And all the way out in Montana. She's from Boston. While out there, she meets a young man named Lucky. Um, he works at the facility. And the novel is just about what happens in their lives. Um, their lives intertwine and then come apart again. And um, I, I think if you're going to read this book, don't read the description in the cover or online or anything, because I think it gives away way too much. I really enjoyed just going into this book and experiencing it as the story unfolded. It's about love, it's about friendship, um, it's about family and motherhood. And through the whole thing, as you can probably tell from the cover, there it's all against a beautiful natural setting. And even when the characters aren't in Montana, nature is still a major theme here. So I really loved Lucky Turtle by Bill Rohrbach. Definitely recommend it. And in terms of a big book, it's not that big. It's just over 400 pages. So definitely pick this one up. My next audio big book was The Cartographers by Ping Shepard. Um, I had previously read her first novel, The Book of M, which was like a post-apocalyptic sort of thing. Um, this one is different, but has some similarities. This book is about maps and mystery and magic, which I hadn't been expecting. The main character is a cartographer, a map specialist, as is her father, and the novel begins with her father um, dying at his desk at the New York Public Library, where she used to work. She and her father have not spoken in seven years. She gets called to the library upon his death and finds out that the police are investigating it as a suspicious death. So that begins part of the mystery. There's also a map involved that she doesn't understand why this map, why her father felt this map was so special. So she also begins investigating the map and that leads her down a path that she never could have imagined. Um, it helps her learn more about her own family history, about the history of her father and his friends and what this map really is all about. So very intriguing, very original kind of story. Um, there is, as I said, some magic, some fantasy, I guess. I really enjoyed the whole package. So that's The Cartographers by Ping Shepherd. 
My next big book was The Overstory by Richard Powers. I don't know if it was technically the longest book that I read, but I think it took me the longest to read um, because it's a very intricate, dense kind of story. Um, it's a very unique, original novel. Um, as you can see, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, it was also on the short list for the Man Booker Prize. And it was on everybody's top 10 list the year it came out, I think 2018. Um, the cover and the beginning pages are filled with rave reviews from famous writers like Ann Patchett and Geraldine Brooks and um, Barbara Kingsolver. Um, it is, as you might've guessed from, from those uh, blurbs, it is about trees and about nature, um, but it's also about people. And ultimately it's about connections. So it's divided into parts the way a tree is divided into parts. And it's labeled that way. Part one is roots and then trunk, crown, and finally seeds. So in the first part, it reads like individual, I think there are nine individual short stories each one about a different person, often involving their family, um, and how somehow a tree or trees were a part of their life and impacted their lives. Um, so each of these stories, it feels like separate stories at the beginning, but in part two, those stories all come together as the characters come together in a, a shared mission to save the trees. And particularly, they head out to the Northwest where there's clear cutting going on of old growth giants. And um, they get involved with that. Um, some bad things happen. They end up splitting up again in the section called Crown. And then Seeds is kind of about looking toward the future. This book is about trees and how they are connected but it's also about connections among people and connections between people and trees. I absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful book to read during the summer, um, even though it was too hot out here to be outside most of the time. <laughs> I did finish the book out on our screened porch with trees all around me. Um, definitely recommend The Overstory by Richard Powers. It, it earned those awards. I started this toward the end of August and I thought this was my last big book, but I was wrong. It is a Stephen King. It's very big. Let me see. Uh, yeah, 520 pages. Um, but it's Stephen King, which means it is so well written and moves at such a fast pace, such a gripping story. I just didn't want to put it down. Now, to be clear, this is not horror. This is not, um, it's not really even suspense or mystery or thriller or any of those other genres that Stephen King is best known for. This is a real life story. Well, it's multiple real life stories. So Hearts in Atlantis is two novellas and three short stories that are all interconnected. So the first novella takes place in 1960 and each of the stories moves forward in time. So in 1960, there's an 11 year old boy named Bobby. He lives in a small town in Connecticut. Stephen King writes so well from a child's perspective. And that first novella is just outstanding. He knocks it out of the park like he always does. So this 11 year old boy named Bobby in 1960 is having to some degree a typical childhood summer at that time, hanging out with his friends, playing baseball, going to the park, um, going to the beach with one of his friend's moms, things like that. But, um, but there are some darker things going on as well. Um, He's worried about his mom. He can tell something's really wrong with her. She's a single mom. He can tell something's really bothering her, but he doesn't know what's going on. There are some bullies that are picking on him and his friends, 
and things escalate. Um, and there's an older man who lives in their third floor. He's a boarder. And um, he and Bobby become quite close over the summer. His name is Ted. And Bobby has just gotten for his birthday the an adult library card so that he can take out any book in the library. And Ted helps him um, choose. He said there are books that are as much fun to read as the books you've been reading, but that also have something deeper. So he starts him with Lord of the Flies, which unfortunately, you know, Bobby can see the parallels with the bullies in his life. Um, so there's this thread of lit literature throughout the book as well, as Bobby is reading all these amazing books this summer, talking to Ted about them. And while he's also having fun, but also worried about these other things. The next story takes place in 1966. One of the kids from Bobby's childhood is in college in, um, in Maine, but she's not the main character. Um, the main character is someone else. The next three short stories follow along in a similar way where there, there's very often one character from one of the earlier stories who shows up in the next story. And it all comes together in such a clever, intricate way. I, I just can't say enough about how amazing this book is. My husband loved it. I know my dad enjoyed it and read it because this was his copy. Just a great book. So Hearts in Atlantis by Stephen King. My last audio big book for the summer was The Madness of Crowds by Louise Penny. That's number 17 in her Inspector Gamache series. I enjoyed this one because it integrated a mystery, a murder mystery, as usual, a crime for the inspector and his, his team to solve. But also it was a very thoughtful and thought provoking book about some of the extremism happening in our culture today and some extreme places where it could potentially lead. So I really enjoyed The Madness of Crowds by Louise Penny. My last audio big book of the summer and a crossover as it was my first book for the RIP challenge for fall. Oh, I skipped one of my audio books. Um, I also listened to Like a Love Story by Abdi Naz Nazamian. I think I got it that time. Um, it is set in, it's a young adult novel set in 1989 New York City. And it's a coming of age novel about three teenagers who are friends. Um, it's about love and romance and coming of age, as I said, but it's all set against this backdrop of the AIDS crisis in New York at the time, which really affected these kids. Um, one is a girl who has an uncle who is gay and is dying of AIDS. His partner has already died. Um, the other two main characters are gay boys. Um, one who has fully embraced his gayness, one um, who grew up in Iran and is really struggling with accepting that he's gay and being in New York during the AIDS crisis is also making him feel like it would be a death sentence to be gay. So he's trying to deny his true nature. Um, it's an amazing book, uh, very emotionally complex. There's a lot to it. Um, I just can't say enough about it. It was really excellent. Like a Love Story by Abdi Nazamian. Finally, my last book book of the summer and my first book for the RIP challenge in the fall, Sycamore Row by John Grisham. It's been years since I've read a Grisham novel. This is kind of a classic legal thriller like he usually writes, and I loved it. Um, it centers on the lawyer from A Time to Kill, which was his first novel, which I read back in the 80s. So luckily he fills in some of the background at the beginning. Um, in this case, the mystery, the, the legal case at the center 
is about a wealthy man who was dying of cancer and committed suicide and left his entire massive estate to his black maid, completely cut out his ex-wives, his estranged children, and left everything to the maid. So as you can imagine, this causes all kinds of uproar with his family, but also in the town. Um, and Jake, the, the lawyer, is at the center of it because this man mailed him a handwritten will before he committed suicide. So Jake is in charge of trying to defend this will that everyone else seems to be against. It's an excellent book. I don't know why it's been so long since I've read Grisham because he's a really great writer. Sycamore Row by John Grisham. And that was my big book summer. If you joined in the challenge this summer, I would love to hear about your big book summer. Let me know in the comments down below. Um, link up your video if you've got a, a big book summer video. Um, I will. There is also a link list, a links list on my blog for big book summer wrap ups or reviews if you want to add your video link to that um, or your blog link. That's it for Big Book Summer 2022. I had a great time. I read some amazing books. I enjoyed great conversations with people in our Goodreads group. And I'm looking forward to the end of next May for Big Book Summer 2023.